Hey there, welcome back. My name is James Taft, and today we're going to be looking at the Raycast 2D node in Godot development. Before we get too far, let's talk about what a ray is. A ray is a geometric figure that has a starting point, ironically called the endpoint, and goes on for forever in one direction. While we won't always be using an infinite distance, the main idea is the same. A raycast is something that has a set starting point and then checks for collisions along a straight line for a given distance. Now, there are many use cases for a raycast in any kind of game development. Today we're going to cover two use cases for 2D development. The first one is something called a hitscan weapon. A hitscan weapon is a weapon that creates an immediate effect along a given ray upon user input. The immediacy of this effect is sometimes masked by adding a trail, particle effects, sounds, anything you like. However, the main idea is the same. The user presses a button, a raycast checks for a collision, and an effect is made. The other use case we're going to be investigating today is how you can use it to create some sort of obstruction between the player and an enemy. Since a raycast checks for physics collisions, you can check to see if the ray intercepts something else before it intercepts the player, and if it does, you can ignore the player's input because something intercepted it first. This can often be used to mimic a line of sight or an obstruction system in a top-down 2D game. Let's take a look at this. The starting version of the project can be found at the GD Quest GitHub page. Let's take a look and see what's already working with this. We have a top-down scene here. We can move our blue capsule player around. There are some static bodies in the scene for them to interact with, and everything's on a Y sort. However, there's no way to interact with these. The first thing we're going to do is create a hitscan weapon for the player. It's going to create a raycast, and where the raycast intercepts a physics object, it's going to create a particle effect. Let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is just discuss our project settings. If you go to Project, Project Settings, the first thing I'd like to discuss is the 2D physics layers. Currently, we have 2D physics layers set for the player, targets, turrets, and the environment. Also inside of Project Settings, let's take a look at the input map. I have the input map set up so that we can move the character up, down, left, and right using either the arrow keys, WASD, or the left stick on a gamepad. I also added a fire button this time, which can be either the space bar on a keyboard or the A button on an Xbox controller. If you look at the objects that we have in our scene, for example, if we look at a target, we can see that the target itself is on the environment layer. However, I added a hitbox for the target that is close up here so it would look like the player is getting a bullseye and I put that on the target layer. If we look at the barricade, the barricade is a static body 2D meaning it's essentially a, an object with infinite mass. This is on the environment layer. The turret consists of a static body 2D and the static body 2D is on the turret layer and there is also a hitbox, which is also on the turret layer. And last but not least, there's a player. The player is set up the exact same way it was in the Area 2D video. We have a kinematic body with a collision shape, and then we have a hurtbox. Looking at the player, if we're going to create a system where the player has a hitscan weapon, we're first going to need to have some sort of indication of which direction the player is facing. Since our player is just a blue capsule, we would usually do this through some sort of animation, but we're going to be adding an arrow that's going to point in the direction the player is moving or was last moving. So with the player, first thing I'm going to do is create a new child node that's just a node 2D to hold the pointer. This node 2D is going to have two child nodes as well. One is going to be a sprite for the actual arrow itself, and the other is going to be a raycast 2D, which is going to be doing all the heavy lifting. For the sprite, in the Assets folder, I have an arrow that we're going to use. And we're going to offset this using the transform by 64 pixels on the X direction, so that it's away from the player. Now if you zoom in, you can see the raycast here. It's an arrow pointing down. By default, when a raycast 2D is created, it casts to 0 on X and 50 on Y. Now we're going to want this ray to cast along the same direction as our arrow here, so I'm going to have it cast to 800 on X and 0 on Y. I'm also going to make sure that it's enabled and under Collide With I'm going to turn on Areas as well as Bodies. 
And for the collision mask, I'm going to set this up so it doesn't interfere with the player. It does the target, turret, and environment. You can see a good representation of what our player's range would be using this. To have the arrow point in the right direction, we're going to change the rotation degrees property of the arrow. Now, if you look right now, if I change that, you can see that when it's above the player, the arrow looks to be above the player. It's not ideal because we'd want it to look like it's underneath the player to kind of fake a 3D element. So to do that, I'm going to take the pointer and I'm going to make sure that it's above the player sprite in our scene tree. This way, if we rotate it around so that it should be behind the player, it looks like it's behind the player. Opening up the player script, let's add some controls for this pointer. The first thing we should do is create an on ready reference to not just the pointer, but also the raycast. Next, we're going to create a helper function that's going to rotate the pointer in relation to the direction in which the player is pointing. Side note, let's talk about trigonometry for a minute. Now we know that if we have an xy coordinate, that xy coordinate can be represented as a vector from the origin to that coordinate. However, it can also be represented as a triangle, with the y side being the opposite and the x side being the adjacent. In that case, we would just need to find the angle in between those two sides. Well, it just so happens that there's a way to do that. In math, the function is called arctangent. The angle would be equal to the arctangent of the opposite over the adjacent, or the y over the x. However, we need to be careful that our x direction isn't equal to zero in this case, otherwise we'll have a divide by zero error. But it just so happens that almost every modern game development engine has a way to protect against that, and we'll talk about what that is in just a moment. Our helper function here is called rotate pointer, and it takes in a point direction as an argument. It also returns nothing, hence the void. This is going to create a temporary variable, and that variable is created by taking our direction that we want it to point and using the arc tangent to find the radian measure of that angle. Then, using radian 2 degree, rad 2 degree, we're going to convert that from radians 2 degrees. After that, we're going to take the pointer's rotation degrees property and set it equal to whatever our temporary variable was. The reason I'm using a tan 2 instead of a tan is I want to make sure that this will never return a division by zero error. Now we need to call the rotate pointer function. In this case, I'm going to call it from the move function. I'm going to check to see if the player did move, and if they did, we'll rotate the pointer. If the player didn't move, we'll leave it pointing whatever the last direction was. So, in the move function, we have if velocity isn't equal to zero, then we're going to rotate the pointer using that velocity vector that we already created. Now, let's test this out. Using a keyboard, you can see that it looks very almost snapping into one of the eight cardinal directions, but if you use a gamepad, I happen to have an Xbox One controller here, you can see that it's much more fluid. And the reason why is using the arrow keys or WASD is a digital control. You don't have very fine control over how much of each axis you're given, whereas an analog control stick can give you much more, a much finer degree of control. Now, we want to use the raycast to decide if the direction the player is facing is colliding with anything. And if it is, and the player presses the fire button, we want to shoot. To do this, we're going to use a function called unhandled input. Unhandled input catches any input that wasn't handled by any script in the previous frame. Our unhandled input function here requires an event as an argument. Then, we're going to check to see if the event is the fire button. And if the event is the fire button and our ray is colliding with something, which is where that collision mask comes into play, so whatever the collision mask allows it to collide with, then we're going to print shoot to the console. Let's test this out. Here we are in our scene. I'm going to have my character walk around a little bit. I'm going to press the shoot button up against things that I know have colliders. And I'm going to need to go back and check my output to make sure that it was saying shoot. Looking in our output window here, we can see that we have shoot quite a few times, probably every time I hit that A button. Now we want this to actually create something though on screen so that we can have some feedback as to what we're doing. To do this, we're going to create a particle effect. Create a new scene, use a 2D root, 
and I'm going to call this hit effect. I'm going to give me two child nodes of this. One is a particles 2D and the other is a timer. Now you'll notice as soon as you add a particles 2D node you have a yellow exclamation point and that's there because we need to create a process material for this. So going over to process material I'm going to create a new particles material and right away you can see that we've got some single pixels dripping down from the center of our scene. Now particles are a pretty big topic and you can spend as much time on particles as you have to spend on it so I'm going to go over just some very basic things. First I'm going to open up the textures I'm going to apply a texture to this so it's not just these bland particles. There is a smoke particle in the assets folder that I'm going to assign as a texture. Already looking better. If you click on the particles material you can now see quite a few things that are usually edited when you're making a particle. First thing I'm going to do though is up here at the top. I'm going to work my way from the top down. I'm going to change my amount from 8 to 6. I'm going to change my lifetime from 1 to 0 0.5. I'm going to leave one shot off for now, but we'll come back to that. I'll leave everything else in here the same. For emission shape, I'm going to change this from point to sphere, and I'm going to give it a radius of 32. Already looking better. Now I'm going to go down, and the next thing I'm going to change is the scale. I'm going to create a new scale curve, and then click on the curve texture, and then click on the curve. I'm going to make this start at 0, and then I'm going to add a point in the middle where it goes all the way up to its full size, and then at the end it's going to tail off almost to 0. Already looking better. The next property I'm going to change is the color. I'm going to go to color ramp and I'm going to create a new gradient texture. If I click on the gradient texture I'm going to create a new gradient and if I open the gradient you can see that we have these little handles here. I'm going to create two more handles in the center. The one on the left I'm going to click on and then use this palette here to choose a new color. So I'm going to have the particle start transparent this first handle I'm going to make fully white, which is 255, 255, 255, for those who haven't worked with colors before. I'm going to make the second handle white as well, 255, 255, sometimes it's hard to grab those little things, 255, there we go. And I'm going to make the last handle fully transparent, so the alpha value is going to go down to zero. Already you can see that this looks a lot better. Now like I said, there are many, many other options, and you can put a lot of fine detail into this, but that's not what this video is about. So I'm going to leave this as it is. I'm also going to turn on one shot before we go any further. Now since I've turned on one shot, that emitting is going to act a little tricky. In fact, if I just change my scene and come back, you'll see emitting turned off. We'll deal with that right now. But before we do that, let's make sure that we save our scene and I'm going to save it into an effects folder. With our scene saved, I'm going to go to the root node and I'm going to add a new script to it. In this script, I want to make sure that the particle system is emitting when it comes in, so I'm going to make an onReady reference to that particle system. Then, in the ready function, I'm going to set the emitting property of the particle system to be true. Now, I want the particle system to not exist in memory forever because if it's not doing anything, there's no reason for it still to be in the scene tree. So, with that timer node, I'm going to set the wait time to be 0.5 seconds, because that's the lifetime of the particle, and I'm going to turn on the auto start. I'm then going to go to the node, find the timeout signal, and I'm going to connect the timeout signal to the hit effect. And all I'm going to do is when that timeout signal comes, cue the particle system free. And I'll clean up just a little bit here. So there we go. Now we have a hit effect. I'm going to save this scene. Now we could, let's look at our demo, we could make it so that our player is creating that particle system as a child of the player. And that way the player knows where it should be because the player has the raycast, but if we do that then the particle system will move around with the player, and that's not what we want. We want the particle system to stay in one spot, eventually stop emitting, and then destroy itself. So, 
rather than having the particle system be a child of the player, let's make the particle system a child of the entire scene. So I'm going to go to my demo here, and I'm going to add a new script to this. Now in here, I'm going to make a reference to that uh, particle system. And since I want to be able to set it in the inspector, I'm going to make it an export of type packed scene. Now I'm going to create a helper function here that is going to create an instance of this particle somewhere on the scene. So this is going to need to have a vector2 of a position as an argument. So our function here is going to generate a hit effect at a given hit position, and it's going to return nothing, hence the void. We're creating a temporary variable, which is an instance of that hit effect. We're adding it as a child to the scene, and then setting its position to be whatever the signal is going to tell it the position should be. Now, the signal, it would make sense, should come from the player, since that's what's listening for the input. So let's go to our player script. In our player script, we're going to create a new signal for when the player has fired a shot. Then, instead of just printing to the console, shoot, we're going to emit that signal along with the collision point of the ray. So our signal is going to look like this. We're emitting the signal, fired shot, and then we're passing in as an argument ray dot get collision point to get the exact point of that collision in world space. Now we need to make sure two things that we've assigned the hit effect to the main scene and that we've connected the signal from the player to the demo. So let's go out of distraction free mode, go to our player, node, fired shot, connect that to the demo, and then when that's called we're going to make sure that this is passing in hit position of type vector2 and then we'll just call generate hit effect and when we call generate hit effect we'll also pass in that hit position argument now we need to go to the demo in the inspector and make sure that this hit effect is actually assigned so into my source and my effects and the hit effect all right, let's save all of our scenes and let's test this out now. So here we are in our scene and let's test this out. So if I go up to the targets here and I hit the fire button, little barricades, turret, and there we go. So we've got our hit scan weapon working as we'd want it to. Now you can use this in a lot of different ways. You can add sound, you can add a trail effect along the raycast, you can add screen shake. But all of that is kind of secondary to the main idea behind this. The player is acting as the endpoint here, creating a ray, and then finding what collision object is intersecting with that ray. And if it's part of what's on the collision mask, then we're creating something. Now you could go further, if you have a health system in your game, by having this also trigger a function to decrease the health by a set amount. However, like I said, the main idea for this video is just to introduce the concept of the raycast and show how you can get things working. So there we go, we have our very first Raycast weapon working. Uh, this is a hit scan weapon, and we're going to continue this tutorial in the next video where we're going to talk about how to make a turret with a line of sight, and that's that little purple capsule up in the upper right hand corner. But for now, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment down below. Otherwise, I hope everybody out there has themselves a wonderful day.